Exodus chapter 8 and verse number 23. Exodus 8, 23. If you're there in your Bible, say amen. If you're there on your phone, say amen. <laughs> Times are changing, aren't they? Can I get witness right there? As long as you're looking at the scripture, that's all that matters. Exodus 8, verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and thy people, and tomorrow shall be this sign. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Now watch this, Go ye and sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meat so to do. In other words, that's not right. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? In other words, he said, we just, we can't do this here. But he said in verse 27, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. But watch this, only ye shall not go very far away. Dear Lord, thank you for the word of God. Give me a clear mind. Give me a filled spirit. And may my heart be in tune with heaven. Lord, may we not hear the opinion of the preacher. Oh God, may we not hear the wisdom of man. But may the scripture speak to us today. And may it not speak to our mind. May it not speak to our emotions. But may it speak to the heart of who we are. To our soul. To our spirit. To that inner man. And from that may our lives be changed. I love you. And I'll praise you in Jesus name. And all God's people said. Amen. You can be seated. In Exodus chapter 8. The Lord has been working in the lives of the children of Israel to deliver them from the bondage of Egypt. Now there's a couple of things I want to say that you have to understand right off the bat. First of all, in our Bible, the children of Israel, they are representative of the people of God. How many of you are glad to be in God's family this morning? That's us. We are the family of God. And the children of Israel here, they are God's people. Also in our Bible, Egypt is a type of the world. This worldly system in which we live. This world that we find ourselves dwelling in. Not the planet of this world, but the ideology of this world. The mindset, the morals, the lack of of holiness, that is, Egypt is a picture of this carnal, wicked world. Also in our text, Pharaoh is a picture of the devil. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Now watch this. The Bible says that the Lord wanted to bring his people out of Egypt and into the promised land or the land of Canaan. I also want to submit to you that Canaan, listen carefully, is a picture of the victorious Christian life. Canaan is not a picture of heaven. I've heard some people say that Canaan land is heaven. I have some problems with that. First of all, there were enemies and giants that they had to fight in the land of Canaan. Somebody ought to help me shout right here. When we get to heaven, the battle is over and the victory will be won. So Canaan is not a picture of heaven, but Canaan is a picture of the victorious, the abundant Christian life. So with all of those things in mind, God longs to bring his people out of the world 
into the victorious Christian life and the devil through Pharaoh here is longing to limit and to restrict them and keep them from living in freedom, in blessing and in the prosperity of God's provision in their life. Now God sent plagues to the land of Egypt. God sent awful plagues to the land of Egypt. They woke up one morning and frogs covered every square inch of the land of Egypt. Now, I like frog legs myself, baptized in grease, dipped in flour. Somebody help me right there. But there's just so many frog legs you can eat at one sitting. And every square inch of Egypt was covered in frogs. God sent a plague where the river, the Nile River, turned into blood Don't be mistaken, if the Bible said it was turned to blood, it was not muddy, it was not red in color. The Nile River literally was turned into blood. He sent one plague after the other, trying to loosen the heart of Pharaoh and build the faith of God's people. And so something happens in this story that Pharaoh begins to reach a place, now here's the key word, a place of compromise. And he begins to offer them a compromise on their way to Canaan. He says, I'm not going to give you all that God wants you to have. Boy, I feel like preaching already this morning. He said, I'm not going to give you everything that God said you can have, but I will give you some compromises and let's see if we can't have one foot in Canaan, one foot in Egypt. You can worship your God, but you're still under my control. You can have a little bit of the promised land, but a whole lot of Egypt. Let's just compromise. And I promise you that if you start living for God, that it won't be long. Somebody help me right here. The devil will offer you some compromises. I heard one man say this. The devil doesn't tell anybody, don't get saved. He just tells them, don't get saved today. He doesn't say, don't live for God. He just says, you don't have to live for God like that. The devil has no problem with a little dose of religion. Why, he encourages people to go to church just enough to soothe their conscience and to satisfy that religious itch in their soul. But God does not want a compromising relationship with us. He wants all of us or he'll have none of us. And so there is compromise that is offered on their way to the promised land. I want to give you three of them this morning. And there may be more, and whatever the Lord says to you, you better do it. But I want to show you three compromises that Satan will offer when we decide to sell our life out over to the glory of God and live in the victory that God offers us. Number one, notice this with me. Notice with me that the first compromise is that Pharaoh said, you can go, just don't go far away. You can go, just don't go far away. That's what he said in the verses that we read. Look down in verse 28. In uh, in verse number uh, verse number 27, Moses said, "We'll go three days' journey into the wilderness." But in verse number 28, Pharaoh said, "That's not going to work for me. You can go." Just don't go very far. How many of you remember when you got saved and God began to change your life and people around you were happy for you until they found out you was for real about living for God? Oh, I feel like preaching this morning. Some people want you to get just saved enough to be a good person. They want you to get just saved enough to be able to deal with. In other words, they want you to get saved enough to where you're not an alcoholic, but they still want you to hang out around the tailgate party. They want you to get saved enough to where you don't wreck your marriage, but they still want you to have girls' night out. 
They still want you to have boys night out. And they don't want you to get a divorce, but they also don't want you to be completely faithful because that's just not living life to the fullest. They'll say things like, well, you know, you ought to go to church, but you don't have to go every Sunday. Anybody ever heard that? And Lord, some of y'all going to Thursday night too and tithing off of your paycheck. What kind of cult have you gotten involved in down there? They want you to go with God, but they don't want you to go very far with God. And that is the ultimate compromise that every Christian faces. When we get saved, there is a burning desire immediately in our heart to pursue the will of God, to live for God, to love Him with all of our heart, our mind, and our soul. And immediately the devil comes along and says, now, look, let's not be a fanatic, okay? Let's not just get crazy. You don't have to go that far. You can go once in a while. I mean, Christmas and Easter ought to hold you over. Let me say something right here. I'm so bad. I'm so wicked. I'm so sinful. I ought to be down here every day having church. I need more than twice a year. Somebody help me right there. Bless God, y'all look at me like that. I'll let your wife get up and testify about your holiness. I mean, if we had service every day, it'd do my heart good. But the devil says, you can can get saved, just don't go crazy. You can serve God, just don't go all out. And that's exactly what Pharaoh said. He said, you can go, just don't go very far. And I wonder what would happen in our lives if we decided that we were going to go all the way with God. Years ago when we were in the cellar's tile building that's no longer there. I had a young man came to church one Sunday morning and he came with some friends and when he came, they brought him into the auditorium, the little room where we, what we called an auditorium. And when they brought him in, immediately so much about this young man just stood out. He was in a wheelchair, bound to a wheelchair He had a form of muscular dystrophy. His legs had no strength whatsoever, really his body at all, but especially his legs. He was dressed in black from head to toe, that gothic look, black boots, black cargo pants, had on a black t-shirt and a black trench coat, had his hair was dyed jet black and just hung down in his face. I never will forget something that stood out. He had safety pins all up and down the side of his trench coat. I thought, praise God, we'll put him in the nursery. He came ready to change diapers, amen. I mean, just a diaper changing machine. Had his fingernails painted black, just that gothic look. About 14 years old. They rolled him in and they put him right up here on the front row. I'm talking about in the spit zone. Can I get an amen right there? I mean, we ought to just, we ought to just pass out them uh, ponchos like they do at SeaWorld for the first three rows. They put him right up here in the spit zone. Man, I got to preaching that morning. The Lord showed up, and halfway through that service, through that sermon, I saw that young man who'd been staring a hole in the floor. I saw that head lift up. And I saw his eyes meet mine. And I'm telling you, there was an emptiness and a hollowness in that boy's eyes, just a void. And I watched him halfway through the message as he locked in. And I watched God begin to speak hope and life and faith into that cold, dead heart. We came to the invitation part of the service and he reached down and threw the brakes off that wheelchair and rolled about five or six feet to the pulpit And I met him right there and on that altar that young man got born again saved by the grace of God. Those eyes that were so dark and empty he began to weep, he began to cry as he poured his heart out to the Lord and got saved and man God drastically and instantly began to move in that boy's life. We would go pick him up for church on Sundays and Thursday nights The fellow that was my assistant pastor at that time, Brother Dan Boatman. Brother Dan was a student up here in Auburn. He'd got called to preach in a revival where I was. Dan was about six foot five, about 280 pounds. And Dan and I would go over to his house to pick him up for church on Sunday. 
And I can remember many mornings that young man coming out of that front door of that little house and a wheelchair ramp just run, I mean, all the way out, way out past the house, out into the yard in order for it to make grade. And I would see him come out of that front door early on Sunday morning. His mother was a practicing Wiccan witch, deeply steeped in the occult, practicing in witchcraft. His his father was out of the picture, but his stepdad was a hard-hearted man, a drunk, uh, uh, actually ran a bar over in Phoenix City. I wouldn't name which one, but some of y'all probably be too familiar with it. It was a biker bar and just a rough man, a rough, just a, a horrible home life. But I can remember little Michael coming out of the front doors of that little house on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, 9.30. And I remember not once, not twice, but many times his mother coming out the door cussing him like a dog as he rolled down that wheelchair ramp. His stepdaddy sitting on the porch swing already drunk by 9 o'clock on Sunday morning laughing out loud while she cussed him all the way down that wheelchair ramp. Brother Dan would load Michael in the car and I'd load the wheelchair and we rode away from that house so many mornings and that young man just sobbing in the back seat trying to live for God with a witch for a mother. I mean a real broom rider. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And a drunk stepdaddy mocking him for going to God's house. But that young man just kept coming, kept being faithful, stayed right there where God had him. One morning I was afternoon, rather was taking him home after the service and Michael spoke up and he said, Brother Jonathan, he said, the Lord's been dealing with me. I said, that's good. He said, the Lord told me that he wants me to preach. I said, hallelujah, that's wonderful. Then he said something else. He said, and the Lord told me that when I preach that I'm not gonna roll to the pulpit, that I'm gonna walk to the pulpit. And I remember hearing those words and I didn't know what to say. I didn't wanna give him false hope. I didn't wanna encourage something that wasn't possible. And that is exactly what I said. I said, Michael, if you can believe God for it, then I can too. And that's all that was said. Well, that was in the spring and that summer we took a load to youth camp, to teen camp. And uh, we had two or three rows of young men that had been called to preach and every service I'd let a couple of them preach during the chapel services or at night. And finally we got to about Wednesday and all of them had preached. I said, if you're a young man that's called to preach but hadn't preached, raise your hand. And Michael was the only one that raised his hand. And here's what I was thinking. Can I just be transparent? I was thinking this boy lives in a house with a witch. He lives with his, his stepdaddy, is a barkeeper. He's only been saved about three months. There ain't no way I can let him preach. There's no telling what he's liable to say. Man, I looked around, I said, is there anybody else that, and he's over there, I mean, like he's got the winning cards, you know. Man, I thought, I can't, so there's nobody else. And so I said, all right, Michael, I said, you get your Bible ready, and you come, and then, and preachers do this. Now, I'm gonna gonna give out one of the secrets of the business. I, I put out a disclaimer. And I said this, I said, now Michael hadn't been saved very long and Michael comes from a real rough background and God's been helping him. And what all that meant was, I am not responsible (laughs) for what comes out of his mouth. Y'all didn't know preachers do that, do you? Some of you are thinking, he said that about me before. (laughs) Well, shoe fit, slide it on, I don't know what to tell you. So I I put out my disclaimer where my hands are clean from whatever he says. And he, I said, Michael, you come on. And when I did, a motion for a young man across across the aisle, motioned for him to come to him. I thought, I don't know what, I thought he was going to push him up to the platform or whatever it might be. And that young man came over and Michael reached down and unsnapped the seat belt in that wheelchair. Glory to God. He took his Bible and he tucked it up under his arm and he lunged out of that chair and he grabbed that young man around the waist and probably from here to that pulpit 
He held on to that young man's waist with his Bible under his arm and he took one weak step after the other, dragging his feet, pulling his feet. And when they got to the pulpit, he he, he dropped his Bible and he held on to the pulpit. And he braced himself and he opened up and he preached out of Matthew chapter 4 on the temptation of Christ. And I've been preaching 31 years and I've heard a lot of preachers, I've heard good preachers get messed up on the temptation of Christ. There's a lot of scripture there that you have to really divide because he was God and he was man and he was tempted to sin but he had no sin in him. He is what we call impeccable. God couldn't sin if he wanted to. And Michael began to preach and I thought, oh Lord, why not just John 3, 16? I mean, come on. And he started talking about He started talking about the deity of God and about the purity of Christ. And he talked about how we ought to deal with our temptation. And I mean, he preached it gun barrel straight, just exactly like it was. And when he got done, I jumped up and said, praise God, that's my preacher boy. I taught him everything he knows. (laughs) But he did, he preached it right. Miss Amy was there, preached it right. I'm talking about preached it right. And before he ever got finished preaching, Those altars was full, not just of teenagers, but grown folk who had been hanging in the balance. God had been speaking, God had been calling, but they had all their reasons on why not. But when that young man stood that morning, God used him to show us that the only way to go with God is to go all the way. And this morning there may be somebody here who thinks you've reached a compromise And you're going to let God have this, but he can't have that. You'll do this for God, but you won't do that. And that may be necessary from time to time, but now I'm not going to do it all the time. I say this morning that we say to our Heavenly Father, have thine own way. There's no closet in my heart that's off limits. There's no place in my life that I don't want your impact. Glory to God. I want to go with the Lord and I want to go all the way. Somebody help me praise God in here this morning. Let's go all the way. There's a second compromise, and I want you to find it. It's offered by Pharaoh's, a picture of the devil, in chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Exodus, look there, and look at verse number 7. Exodus 10 and verse 7. And Pharaoh's servant said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? The locust had shown up between chapter 8 and chapter 10. And look in verse 7 what they said. Let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Knowest thou not yet that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh. And he said unto them, Go serve the Lord your God. But watch the compromise. But who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young, amen, and with our old, hallelujah, with our sons and with our daughters, with our flocks and with our herds will we go, for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. Now look at me right here. Here's the second compromise. Pharaoh said, you can go, go as far as you want, but only let the men go and keep the women and the children behind in Egypt. The second compromise is you can go, just don't worry about taking anybody with you. I mean, you can go. You go do what you need to do. You follow God, but you keep it to yourself. Has anybody ever heard that before? You can be a Christian, but you don't need to shove it down everybody's throat. You can be a Christian, but don't bring it to work with you. You can be a Christian. There's a time and a place, but not on the job, not at the school, not at the ball field. I mean, you can be a Christian down there at the church, but on Sunday you take care of all of that and don't you try to take anybody else with you. But there's a real problem with that. This thing is not just for me. It's not just for you. Somebody help me right here. 
it is for everybody. And it's not just for daddy, it's for mama. And it's not just for daddy and mama, it's for the children. It's for my neighbors. It's for strangers that I may never see again. I don't want to go by myself. I want you to go with me. That's what Pharaoh said. He said, you can go, but just let the men go. Don't take those kids. Don't make the late, don't let the ladies go. And here's what the devil, here's what the devil was doing. He knew that if the men went and the children and the women stayed behind, that eventually in a generation or two, it would be obscure, it would be foreign, and they would be more adapted to the ways of Egypt than they were the ways of God, and it would die with the men, and it would never spread into their families. Can I say something to you? Wouldn't it be a God-awful shame for you and I to live the victorious Christian life and watch our families suffer and struggle from the pitfalls of the devil caught up in a lifestyle that brings nothing but heartache and hurt. I want God to move in my life, but I want God to work in my wife's life. I want God to be real in my life, but I want my son to have a relationship with God. And so I'm not only going to go I'm going to take everybody I can with me. When I first got saved, I was young. I was seven years old when I got saved. And I had a best friend that came to church with me. And his mom and daddy didn't go to church. A very rough home and a rough life. But he would come with his uncle who was our song leader. And I remember the... You know, church kids, we, we, we learn stuff about church and we learn how to have a good time. I was keenly aware of where they hid all of the animal crackers for the nursery. And praise God, I knew where they stored that Welch's grape juice for communion, amen. And as soon as church was over, man, we'd bust the back doors down, raiding the animal crackers and playing and having fun like kids ought to do. But man, that night that I got saved, Do you know that immediately the first thing that happened in my heart was I had a burden to see my best friend, Joe, hear what I had heard. I wanted him to know what I knew. And I wanted him to go to heaven with me. We went out the doors of that little church, that little country church, and I remember clear as day running around the side of that building, and before we started playing war and stealing God's crackers out of the nursery, I said, Joe... I won't tell you what happened to me tonight. And I shared with him what God had done for me. Ladies and gentlemen, if God really works in our life, there will be a desire in our heart to not only have it, help me right here, but to share it as well. How can I have this hope, this peace, this joy, this treasure, and not want others to know what I know? Pharaoh said, you can go, just don't take anybody with you. I'm going to need an amen right here. Wherever you go, someone is going with you. If you backslide and go to this world, you're not going alone. When Simon Peter threw up his hands and said, I go a fishing, the other disciples said, we go also with you. If you go back, you're taking your family with you. If you go back, you're taking your friends with you. If you go back, your influence will be felt in a negative direction. But praise God, if you go forward, you're taking somebody with you. If you go on with God, you're going to have a crowd behind you. When Adam put glory, I'm having a good time this morning. When Adam, this is helping me with my depression from yesterday, amen. When Adam put on those skins of forgiveness, Eve put on those skins as well. When Philip got saved, he went down and found Nathaniel and said, you've got to come see a man that knows everything I've ever done. When Abraham went up Mount Moriah and met with God, thank the Lord Isaac, fell in behind him and his life was changed. When Moses went into the tabernacle and the glory of God fell, it was Joshua that came out saying, I want what Moses had. And if you and I really walk with God all the way, there'll be an overflow in our life that not only reaches our family, that not only reaches our children, but it will touch lives around us that we didn't even know needed touching. I have a, some of a prayer request this morning. I've been witnessing to a friend of mine for two years. 
And I've invited them to church. I've asked them to come. I've uh, friend day, neighbor day, you name it. I've pushed them to come and they've never even given me a, a half a promise. You know, a lot of people just lie to you. But I had not even been lied to yet. Just no, not interested, no thank you. But two weeks ago, I got a late night text that said, what time's church start in the morning? And I'm here to tell you that if God's really working in your life, it will work, glory. I said if God's really working in your life, he'll work in somebody else's life. And how foolish would we be to have all of what God's done for us and not share it into the lives of somebody else. Can I get an amen right there? Number three, I'll give you this one, then I'll be done. Look in chapter 10, verse number 23. Chapter 10, verse 23. If you're there in your Bible, holler, amen. Amen. Another plague has fallen. God has sent darkness into the land of Egypt. And look in chapter 10, verse 23. They saw not one another. Neither rose any man from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God put Egypt in blacked out darkness. They couldn't see their hand in front of their face. They could not move an inch without bumping into something. But where the children of Israel lived, there was natural sunlight just as plain as we have out here today. So Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Now watch, here's his compromise. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones go also with you. He said, you can take the whole family this time, but don't take your flocks. And Moses said, thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Look at me right here. Here's the third compromise. Pharaoh said, okay, you can go as far as you want. (laughs) You can take your whole family, but don't take your herds and don't take your flocks. Now I have a question. Why would Pharaoh say that? And Moses' rebuttal was, we have to take them because, glory to God, because when we get there, we're going to have a blood offering and a blood sacrifice, and we're going to give it to God because blood is what he has always required of us. So Pharaoh is saying essentially to them, you can go... Just don't go through the blood. And may I say to you this morning that the devil does not mind you having a little dose of religion. I'm not trying to be ugly this morning and I'll put all of us in here together so you think I'm not picking on anybody but hell is going to be populated with Baptists who sat on pews, who who were over councils, who had been through the baptistry but they had never been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hell is full of Methodists who are sprinkled, but their lives were never changed by the power of God. Hell is littered with Pentecostals who had experiences emotionally, but they were never washed in the blood of Jesus. The devil does not mind you being religious. He does not want you being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. See, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Did y'all pick up on that? If I missed you, let me know. I'll come back. Make sure we run over you too, okay? I'm trying to show you there's nobody that's going to get into heaven without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I love that song that was the tag on Brother Jerry's song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I praise God. Moses said if we go, we cannot go unless we have the blood sacrifice to go with us. And our victory as a believer is not found in turning over new leaves. Y'all do know that, right? I mean, some of us, we done flipped over all the leaves, cut down the tree, and we're still messed up. Hello, somebody, wake up and holler, amen. You can't turn over enough new leaves to put you in the promised land. The only way you'll ever have victory as a child of God is when we walk in the cleansing power of His precious blood. I like that verse that said, His blood cleanseth us from all sin. That is a present progressive tense. Cleanseth doesn't mean one time He cleansed. Doesn't mean in the future He will. But right now, every second, every moment, every hour, every day, He is continually washing me and keeping me pure in the sight of my heavenly father 
And if you're going to have victory, you're going to go through the blood of Jesus Christ. Brother Jerry, come to the piano, if you will. I'll tell you this story. That song that we sang, What Can Wash Away My Sin? Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. That was written by a man named William Cowper. William Cowper was born into the home of a preacher. His daddy was a man of God. When William was six years old, in the birth of his younger brother, his precious mother lost his life. His father didn't know what to do nor how to raise all these children without a spouse. And so he sent them off to a home, to an orphanage where they were raised and schooled and educated, but they had no affection, no love, no family unit in their life. As a young man, he fell in love, which young men ought to do. And by the way, it was with a girl. Can I get an amen right there? Just throwing that out there. Fell in love with a young lady, and she broke his heart. And after she broke his heart, his life fell into depression. Not only did it fall into depression, but he became just vehemently suicidal. And he ended up in an insane asylum. I'm talking about locked away. And we're not talking about 2019 a sane asylum. We're talking about in the late 1700s, 1760s, 1770s. I mean, little more than a jail. And he was locked away in an insane asylum. No mother to love him, no family to care. The broken heart of rejected love lost his mind and wanted to lose his life. He got out of that insane asylum and ended up Listen to this, living in the backyard of a man by the name of John Newton. Have y'all ever heard of him? Maybe you know some of his work, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And God put William Cowper living in John Newton's backyard. And it was there that he got saved. And it was there that he was delivered from uh, an emotionally empty childhood, from a broken heart that love had shattered and from a mind that sin and pain had racked and wrecked for years. And when he got saved, he sat down and penned these words, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, I'm here to tell you this morning, tithing's good, but it won't wash away your sin. Church attendance is good, but it cannot clear your name in heaven. Good deeds are wonderful, but they do not buy us favor with the Father. What can wash away our sin? What can take me out of, the, out of the world and put me into the victorious Christian life? It is nothing but the blood of Jesus. And this morning while I'm preaching, look at me right here. While I'm preaching, the devil says, man, that's good preaching. I wish old so-and-so was here to hear it. But this wasn't for old so-and-so. This is for you. Because the devil's offering you that compromise, saying you don't have to do all that. You don't have to go all out. Well, you're all right with where you are. But I want to bring him everything, all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and I want to walk in total victory. Can you give God praise for his word this morning? 